If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. If you're using the Pew Bible before you, it's on page 984. But we're going to continue tonight our study in Paul's letter to Colossae, the church, the believers there. We look in just at three verses tonight, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. And while you're turning, let me just give us something of a little bit of a, of a brief recap. Typical of the way Paul writes in his epistles, he begins this epistle using the first approximately half of his letter to unpack for us some very uh, deep uh, deep doctrinal truths that are very rich in theology. And his focus in this first two chapters really has been to help establish the all surpassing greatness and the importance of Jesus Christ. He wants this firmly lodged in our minds so that we understand just how great, how preeminent Jesus Christ truly is. Now, beginning in chapter 3 in the closing chapters of the epistle, he's moved on now to begin to address the practical implications that those truths have as they are applied to our lives. Specifically, I think, beginning there in chapter 3, Paul has been pointing to our sanctification, even more specifically to our role and our responsibility in cooperating with the Holy Spirit in the process of our sanctification. So he begins by telling us in chapter 3 to seek or to set your mind on things above rather than on the earthly things, the things that normally just clamor for our attention while we live here below. He follows this then with an apparent increased sense of urgency as he begins to tell us what we are supposed to do in order to seek the things that are above. We need to put to death those things that are below. In verse 5, he lets us know what they are. He unpacks them categorically for us. Then he moves on, picking up his pace in verse 12. Instead of these things, put on what he now lists, beginning in verse 12. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And then it's as if Paul wants to just put a, a bow tie on this package for us. He wants to tie it all together with a bow on this process or this formula of sanctification as Pastor Bruce uh, so well unpacked it for us a couple weeks ago in our last study. But in verse 14, he says, above all of this, put on love. Because love is what binds everything together in perfect harmony. So now in the verses that we're about to consider together tonight and the time we have, Paul shares with us what, what I would call the characteristics or the marks of a Christian's life when Christ is preeminent. There's three truths that I think Paul wants us to see, at least I want to help highlight for us tonight. The first being is when Jesus has first place, our lives are marked by his peace. Second, when Jesus has first place, our lives are saturated with his word. And last, when Jesus has first place, our lives are overwhelmingly thankful. Let's look now together at God's holy and inspired word, beginning in verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Verse 17, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's holy and inspired word by his grace and his mercy may now be preached and presented to you. You know, uh, this is the first opportunity I've had to step back behind this pulpit to teach or to preach since God called our beloved pastor home. And I couldn't help but think even this afternoon how it might catch me a little bit off guard even to stand up here right now because on Sunday night, one of the things I loved always hearing our pastor say Whenever he would start walking through something that was very practical and very helpful to us and the way that we would live our Christian lives, he would say, you know, I want to just approach this kind of like you're my small group Bible study. Uh, you're a little bit large for a small group, but I want to do this in a small group setting. And I'm glad he would do that because as I was studying these, these three verses over the last several weeks, 
One of the things that uh, God has wired me for, I guess, came to the forefront. I absolutely enjoy when we get to a passage of Scripture and it becomes a fascinating word study. I like looking at the nuance of the words in the original language. I like looking at the context. I like making sure I can unpack and understand what was the author when God, the Holy Spirit, inspired this author to write what he wrote. What was he saying to that original audience? How would they receive it? How would they understand it? How would they hear it? Because they understood every one of the original words in the fullness and the depth of their meaning. So I've had a lot of great fun as I've been studying over the last several weeks preparing for this sermon. I've debated about do I, do I uh, feel excited that I only have three verses to cover or, or do I feel afraid that I only have three verses to cover? But the more that, that I've looked into it, I think I'm a little bit more afraid that I only have three verses to cover that I won't get done on time. So we're going to keep a good eye on the clock up there and we'll still get out of here hopefully in a reasonable hour tonight. But I do want to just kind of look through what what we're, what we're wanting to unpack, because Paul begins this in a very interesting way. The word that he uses in English is a simple little word for us, let. Oh, but there's a lot to that little three-letter word. It's much like the word he used back in verse 2 of chapter 3 when he tells us to set. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on this earth. Well, what he's telling us with this little word, let, and in the original language, again, it's in the imperative tense. You know what an imperative is. An imperative is something that you have to do. It's imperative, Johnny, that you clean your room before you go out and play ball. Well, that's a command. So we receive this command from Paul. He begins by saying, let, just like he used the word set back in verse 2. So that tells me something. When we're given a command, that means there's, kind of implicit in this, I think, three um, realities, I guess, for the best, lack of a better word, three realities that we really can ill afford to neglect. The first reality is if he's telling us to do something, that means we actually have the ability to do it. So, for example, if, if we're losing, using verse 2 as the example to start us off, set your mind on things or above, I can take this cup of water that somebody graciously brought up here for me tonight, and I can choose to set it right here but I could just as easily choose to set it over here. Now, some of you are afraid I'm going to knock it over and spill it on my Bible, so I'm going to set it back where it was out of the way. But when we are looking at a command like set or let, we know right there that we have an ability and a responsibility to make a choice. So not only can we choose, but we have the responsibility to choose, to act on whatever it is that we're being told to do. With that ability and that responsibility, then also comes accountability. So as we are being told, as Paul begins this little vignette, this three, three verse paragraph, to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, we know that we can do that. We have the ability. We also know that I should do that. I have the responsibility. And one day, what I choose to do with the peace of Christ will be judged either by my actions here among you or definitely before the Lord. There is accountability in what I choose to do or not to do. So Paul begins this very practical application of the all-surpassing greatness of Jesus by giving us a command, let the peace of Christ rule in your lives. Clearly, there's a choice to make. We can choose either to permit his peace to rule our daily lives, or we can choose to go down some other path, ignoring the peace that's available always to any who seek it, but we don't get to choose the consequences that go with it, either the positive ones or the negative ones. But I think before we go any further, we need to understand something else that Paul's talking about here. When he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, what kind of a peace is he talking about? You know, peace is actually a fairly common word in our English language. In the New Testament, English translations of this uh, word peace shows up in our New Testaments over 90 different times. So it's easy for us to do a word study in depth. But you know, when, when we think of peace, for example, in the, in the context of what we even see on the news from day to day, we might be thinking of the war in Ukraine. We might be thinking a cessation of, of hostilities to an end of the war. 
for Russia to pull its troops out and for things to be restored to something of a normal so they can begin to rebuild the, the war-ravaged country as a result of, of the uh, aggression of Russia. We might even be thinking of relationships with a family member or with a friend. And when we think of peace there, maybe we think of the healing of the relationship, the restoring of the relationship, no longer being at odds with someone that we care about deeply. But I think even more than this, Paul wants us to see that this peace of Christ surpasses just what we see on the surface. In order for us to grasp the broader meaning of peace, I think it's going to help us. We need to contextualize this as though we were hearing it with understanding from Paul himself. You see, this is no ordinary or man-generated peace that Paul's talking about. Rather, it's not even a, what I might call a, a feigned peace or a fabricated peace, something that we just pretend exists in order to get by for the moment. You know how we can try to appease the situation. We just try to have peace at any cost. Even Jeremiah, prophets as long ago as Jeremiah warned about this, he said, there will be those, many of those, who will proclaim peace, peace, when there is no peace. And maybe they proclaim peace, peace, trying to establish a feeling of peace so that they can still accomplish their end, their aim, whatever it is that they were trying to get by decrying peace when it was not there. But this peace that Paul calls us to in verse 15 is the peace of Christ. Well, that tells me right away it's divine in origin and it's completely other in its scope. The origin is from Christ himself. I like that he uses the word Christ here. We know Christ to mean the title, Jesus Christ the Lord. Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one. Well, to the Jews of Paul's day, that has deep implication and meaning. To talk about the Christ was to talk about the long-awaited Messiah. Now, to call Jesus the Christ was a, was a sticking point for most of the Jews. But Christ the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, is offering us his peace. Divine in origin, Jesus himself assures us of that back in John chapter 14. There in verse 27, he assures us, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Later in chapter 16 of the same gospel, he goes on to explain, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Well, the peace of Christ, or peace that Jesus freely gives to all of those who by faith avail themselves to it, far surpasses any human comprehension. It's that peace that passes all understanding. Of course, it's, it, it is known by those who, facing some sort of an ongoing struggle or strife, now see that, that issue resolved and the conflict disappears. We, we understand and we appreciate peace like that, don't we? Whether it's a medical crisis, whether it's a relational crisis, whether it's some other nature, but whenever we are in conflict and then suddenly we realize the conflict has ceased, peace is here, that is one aspect of the peace that God gives us through his son, Jesus Christ. But I have to be candid with you. There's another aspect of the peace of Christ that is what I've been wrestling with the majority of my time studying over the past month or so on this passage. And that peace is peace in the middle of the conflict that doesn't go away. You know that kind, you know, the, the prolonged illness, And we pray in faith, believing, maybe we even have an anointing, and we're there with and we're for you, and we're still fighting the battle alongside of you, but it's relentless. Or that relationship, that strained relationship, either at home or in the workplace, or even in the church dynamic, is still there, and no matter how much you work to try to see the peace of Christ, bring peace to the situation, it stays the same. What does the peace of Christ look like in that context? Well, candidly for me, what the peace of Christ has been looking like in that context is he's giving peace internally to me. Circumstances haven't changed, but my heart has changed. 
And maybe that's what he was after all along. When he changes my heart, I can find peace in the circumstance, peace in the middle of the storm. Remember the old gospel song, sometimes he calms the storm, other times he just speaks peace into his child. We can have the peace of Christ regardless of what's going on around us. We have the peace of Christ available to us always, no matter what it is that we're facing. This is the peace of Christ that John Huss experienced in July of 1415. Having been declared a heretic and an arch enemy of the church, John Huss was condemned to die. He was to be burned at the stake. They chained him by his neck to the stake. He kisses the chains, and then he prays out loud, Lord Jesus, I patiently endure this cruel death. But he didn't only say that. He went on to say, and Lord, forgive my executioner. There's a peace that passes understanding, so much so that even 100 years later, that same peace of John Huss would become alive one more time because there was another monk in that same area. His name was Martin Luther. And Martin Luther would quote something else that Huss said at that moment when Huss was dying. He had said something to the effect that Luther quotes, you may roast the goose, a play on words there because Huss means goose in his Bohemian tongue. You may roast the goose, but a hundred years from now will a swan arise whose singing you will not be able to silence. And the Huss's voice had long since been silenced. It was a hundred years from that moment until the moment that Luther nailed 95 theses on the church door of Wittenberg, and the beginning of the full Reformation would start. As John Piper has rightly said, truly the swans proclaiming the truth of the gospel could not be silenced. See, believers can experience peace regardless of their circumstances. Why? Because the peace of Christ was wrought at great price. See, the peace that we experience begins with the peace that we only know through Christ as he makes us at peace with God the Father. Unless and until we come to Jesus Christ in saving faith, there is no peace. Oh, we can fake it, and we can enjoy some measures of peace on the surface, but there's no true peace because until we're right with God, we know no peace. However, because of the Son and the work that he did, because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and won for us peace with God now and forevermore. And it's based on that same peace that we can now see peace in us bringing an end to hostilities between brother and brother, between husband and wife, or into any number of any other types of relationships that are strained as believers choose to let the peace of Christ redirect the trajectory of their lives. Remember, we have a choice. We can choose it over here, or we can choose it over here. We can let the peace of Christ rule in our lives. Well, what does he mean by rule? I like that word. I wish Pastor was here. He would tell some of the most fascinating baseball stories ever. You know, the, the, the umpire, you know, it's this Pastor be catching the ball, and this guy's over, breathing over his face, and he would call it a ball or he'd call it a strike. You might disagree with whatever he called, but the bottom line was when he made his ruling, it stood. The umpire has the final word. So if you were called out, you were out. If you were called safe, you were safe. That's the exact same connotation of the word here, rule. Literally, in the Greek, it would point us to the Olympic game type games that they would have and the judges who would rule in the competition, and their ruling would stand. So what's Paul telling us? Let, choose, you make the choice deliberately, the peace of Christ, to rule, to have the final say in what's going on in your life and what's going on in your relationships and what's going on in your friendships. He says, let the word, uh, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Well, the heart is the center of our emotions. The heart is the center of our thinking. Out of the heart, the abundance of the mouth speaks. 
Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we know that it's deep-seated within us. He's saying, let the peace of Christ rule, umpire, have the final word as deep in your inner soul and your inner being as it possibly can. It's a pretty tall order to let the word, uh, the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. But then Paul goes on and he tells us, not only should you do this, not only must you do this as a Christian, it's a command, but he tells us why. In verse 15, again, he continues, let it rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Now he has pointed not only beyond the, the ability that we have, to choose to let it rule or not to let it rule. But he says, not only do you have the ability, but you have the responsibility. Indeed, this is your calling. That's your divine responsibility. Just like Paul would identify himself, called of God to be an apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle out of due season. Paul had a calling. We each, as Christians, we have a calling. What's our calling? To let the peace of Christ rule have the final say. Well, what does that look like for us if we're going to let it have the final say? How do we let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to which indeed that's our calling in one body? Well, I believe it starts with we become unified. When the peace of Christ is ruling, when Jesus' agenda has the final say in what we're doing, it creates unity. Let it rule. Let it umpire. Let it have the final say. That looks like me many times over in the last several weeks when situations got stressful, going immediately and saying, Jesus, what would your peace look like here? Jesus, how would I, how would I actually magnify the peace of Christ in this situation? Well, I learned a couple of practical things. Sometimes exalting the peace of Christ means dying to yourself. You may think you have the right, I did many times, to stand up for myself, to, to speak for myself, to clearly defend myself. And Jesus said, is that letting my peace rule? And I found that the more often I would practice dying to myself and choosing the peace of Christ to rule, it was making a difference in the dynamic of the relationship that I was having the struggle in. Many different ways, but that's exactly what he is calling us to. But he also says we're accountable. We're accountable to let it rule. We each individually, as well as all of us collectively, are given this responsibility to choose peace in the face of conflict, regardless of what others choose to do. Doesn't that make you a doormat, Pastor Jim? Doesn't that let people just kind of walk all over you and do whatever they want? It might. Jesus chose the peace of Christ he chose the peace of God, and it looked like he had become a doormat as he was hung on the cross, but he rose from the grave. He chose the better route. He chose the more desirable, and the peace of God in Christ ruled. I think John Calvin understood the priority of this task of letting the peace of Christ rule. He puts it in the right perspective simply by saying, we cannot be in a state of agreement with God otherwise than by being unified among ourselves as members of one body. Leads, I think, to a very logical uh, question, doesn't it? How can we fulfill this divinely given responsibility to have peace ruling, reigning? It's a calling that we're all supposed to collectively pick up and shoulder together. How do we fulfill this divinely given responsibility in ways that reveal we are increasingly experiencing his peace. Well, I think Paul gives us the right answer as he adds a second command for us to obey. When he says, when Jesus has first place in our lives, our lives are saturated by his word. Look at verse 15, 14, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. Again, we start with that word, let, allow, choose, direct. Deliberately choose or permit another reality to consistently mark your life, and that reality is the saturation point of God's word. See, God's word is meant to be something more than just an occasional guest. 
in and out of the homes of our lives. You know, you know the company that's coming to stay with you and you're, you're sort of looking forward to it and you're sort of not. And, and you're, you kind of grudgingly say, oh, yeah, y'all come on. And the moment they get there, you're all happy, 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 but soon you're just like, man, when are they gonna leave? Unfortunately, I'm afraid that's way too often we can treat God's word. We wanna let it in a little bit. We wanna let it have a, a nook or a cranny of our lives. But what Paul is calling us to do when he says, let the word of God dwell in you richly, we're supposed to have an open door policy. See, when, when he dwells, when his word dwells in us, it completely fills every aspect of our lives. When it dwells richly, not feebly, but richly, abundantly, let it dwell abundantly. It has to permeate every aspect of who we are and what we're doing. God's thinking becomes our thinking. His way becomes our way because we simply have saturated our minds and our hearts in the word of Christ. It's dwelling. It's residing. It's actually not just residing. It is the master of our lives. It's taking control. Well, what happens, unfortunately, when we only partially let the word of God come and go is that we partially let it reign in our lives, and we end up in all kinds of conflict, and the peace of Christ is broken. So if we're struggling and we don't see that the peace of Christ is in our lives, perhaps we need to look first about how much is the Word of God dwelling in my life right now? Am I fully saturating my life with God's thinking? Now, I'm just going to say this by way of a personal testimony. This is not descriptive of something you need to go out and do beginning tomorrow. It's, this is not prescriptive. It just describes what God has put on my heart and what I've been doing for the last roughly three years. What I've done over the last three years is by reading five Psalms, chapters of the Psalms a day, you can read the entirety of the book of Psalms in a month. And God just put it on my heart that I needed to be soaked in the Psalms, and I've been reading the Psalms once a month, each month, for going on three years. Well, now, you may be a bit like me, you could try to put me on the spot right now and quote me a verse and say, Jim, what chapter, what verse? And I'll look at you like I have no clue at all. Because somehow my, my mind struggles there. But you know what I do know is the truths of the Psalms have become mine. I actually have a sheet that I will never share with you, but it's simply titled, My Psalms. Because they come alive. Because I see them and I feel them welling up within me, coming out of me. And the truth of those psalms is influencing the relationships I have with others. Well, I think that's what saturation does. You know what's when the ground gets saturated? It can't take in anything more. You get a sponge, it's saturated. You can't take in any more water until you squeeze some out. Well, when the Word of God saturates our lives, it wells up within, and it can't help but overflow. It's going to overflow into the relationships that you have at home, at the workplace, every dynamic that you could possibly think of, the ball field, it's going to overflow and it's going to supersede if it's truly saturating our lives. So I think Paul is telling us if we want the peace of Christ ruling, then the word of Christ has to dwell, it has to inhabit, it has to take up residence in us, not feebly, but completely, abundantly, richly. And then I like that he doesn't just say do it, he gives us a reason to do it. He says, teaching and admonishing one another. Well, now that's getting a little stickier, isn't it? Because that sounds like I've got some responsibility to you. And you have some responsibility to me. See, I'm to know God's word so adequately. that when your heart's breaking and you're grieving, or when you're rejoicing, over some success that God has given you, I should be equipped to be able to speak biblical truth, even if I can't give you the chapter and verse and be a walking concordance, I can speak the truth and love into your heart as the Holy Spirit uses me in such a way that it encourages you and lifts you up. I'm to teach you, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian. And you're to teach me 
because you're a brother or sister in Christ. You are to be so saturated with me in God's word that we can freely speak God's word into each other's lives 24-7 in such a way that it lifts us up, it encourages us, it carries us over the hump, whatever it is that we need, up to and including even giving words of exhortation. You know, one of the brothers I appreciate most and perhaps he knows who it is that I'm talking about, but one time he exhorted me. He called me out with God's word. And by God's grace, I took it to heart. And it changed the way and the path and the direction I was going. That's how we should be. We should be bold enough to let the Holy Spirit use us that if we love each other deeply enough, Remember, love, above all these, put on love. If we are really loving one another, if we are seeking the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit collectively in us, then I have to care about you enough to teach and admonish. And I would hope that you would care enough about me to do the same because I still have a lot to learn and a lot that God's working on to correct in my life. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing, but then he gives some practical helps. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, how? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. I love this verse. Paul loved it so much that he had to say this not here only, but also in Ephesians. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You know, you might think as a pastor, sometimes we just kind of get on a roll and we say it and we say it again and then we say it one more time just to make sure you heard us say it. That's not what Paul's doing here. These words have distinction, they have difference, they have meaning, they have purpose. The Psalms we would know as the Psalter. It's the oldest hymn book that there is still in existence today. It was what the Hebrews sang regularly. Well, the beauty of knowing the Psalms is you can now put them to music. I love great settings, new contemporary settings of the old Psalms. Why? Because then they stay in my mind. They go with me. You know the power of music. You know how it sticks with you. Those songs that, you, you ever have one of those songs you just wake up in the morning and it's just pounding through your head and you go, where did that come from? And I can't get rid of it. It's the power of music. But boy, when it's the power of music with, with scripture put to it, what a blessing. See, when we sing the psalms, we're singing literally sometimes psalms, and we're also singing other passages of scripture set to good music so that it instills deeply within us. But we also sing hymns. Hymns are those, those songs of praise in which we exalt and exalt in our Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty. We tell him how great he is as we sing the songs. And then the songs of praise. That's where we might stand up here and sing about what God has done in my life in such a way that it points to him. There's a richness and there's a fullness of this type of music and this type of worship and this type of building each other up. And you know, the great, the great hymnist, they knew it. Martin Luther knew it. A mighty fortress is our God. And he picked a tune that everybody knew. Charles Wesley knew it. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? The Gettys know it. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone. See, for any of us that have memory challenges trying to keep scripture passages by verse, when you set it to music, it tends to go deep into your heart and deep into your life, and it stays there. When's the last time you sang, Jesus loves me, this I? Yeah, it stays. Incredible truths deep within our souls. And Paul wants that. He wants the peace of Christ to, to reign, to rule in our lives. He wants the word of Christ to dwell richly, which is why he says, do it with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with wisdom and with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. But then he goes on yet to the third and final of, of the character marks, I believe, of, of a Christian whose life is really um, given over to the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Verse 17, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, when Jesus has first place in our lives, not only 
Does the peace of Christ reign? Does it rule? Not only does the word of God, the word of Christ dwell richly, but our lives become marked by thanksgiving. I love our Thanksgiving services when we get to get together at Thanksgiving and we get to share some of the blessings that God has done. But you know, every day ought to be one of those services. We are to be saturated with thanksgiving. Paul is wrapping it all together. He's saying, whatever you do, in case I've let the category out by these other verses that just preceded in chapter 3, in case anything's been left out, he says, whatever you do, do all. He said it more than once, again, in Corinth. He said, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God in 1 Corinthians 10. Peter echoes the same truth when he himself adds that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. And our Westminster divines, they, they put it to us first. What is the chief end of man? Yeah, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. See, everything we do in the workplace, everything we do in our homes, everything we do on the ball field or in the classroom or whether we're driving or whether we're flying or whether we're sitting in an airport fuming over the fact that yet another flight is delayed or canceled because of whatever, everything that we do is supposed to be done in agreement with who Christ is and what he has done for us. That means everything we say in public, in our homes, Everything we say out loud, everything we say in that silent conversation that seems to be unending in our heads. These two should conform to what God has revealed about himself through Jesus Christ, his son. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he's Lord of all and he's Lord in all. You see, he laid down his life to have a rightful claim over us. And we've received the gift of belonging to him. You know, thanksgiving is simply an act of acknowledging that something has been given to me that I didn't deserve, and therefore I am grateful. You know, Paul thinks so much of this last aspect. You notice three times in three verses, he tells us, verse 15, be thankful. Verse 16, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Verse 17, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Why does he hit gratitude so hard? Could it be that a lack of gratitude might be one of the greatest enemies to our sanctification? Could it be that an unthankful spirit robs us of the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts? Could it be that an ungrateful heart is, a, is indicative of a heart that is not saturated with God's word? Paul calls us out in this. He tells us, what do you have that you haven't received? The answer implied, nothing. The greatest gift of all that we received is salvation, something we didn't deserve. But see, the opposite of a grateful heart is a selfish heart. A selfish heart is entitled God, I deserve this. God, I deserve that too. And God, I don't deserve what you're giving me. Give me something better. That's the grumbling spirit of a non-thankful heart. Give thanks in everything. Give thanks for everything. That means the good things that we think are good and those things that we think are not so good. Jim, how can I give thanks for trials and tribulations? Jim, how do I give thanks for the fact that the cancer is still here and it hasn't gone away? Not only has it not gone away, but it's getting worse and worse by the day. How can I give thanks when we look to what God has given us instead of to the circumstances surrounding us? We find plenty for which to be thankful. See, in adversity and in trial, I can choose, again, I can choose where I'm going to set my affections, where my mind's going to be, what I'm going to think about, what I'm going to look at. I can choose to focus on God Almighty. And he gave me something I couldn't deserve, everlasting life. He gave me a a wife that loves me, and that's no small order. He gave me kids that love him and serve him and grandkids that are learning the same thing. He gave me you 
each and every one of you, to rub shoulders with, to bump along in this life with, to encourage, to be encouraged by, how can I not be thankful? How can I stop being thankful for what God has freely given? Uh, but if I get selfish, if I get self-centered, if I get myopic and start looking at me, 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 I quickly will forget what I'm supposed to be thankful for out there with you. So Paul has brought us through this. He's tied it all together for us. He's let us know that the word of Christ is to rule, which means it has the final say. I should be living to promote the peace of Christ, not the agenda of myself or anyone else. He's also told me that the word of Christ should dwell richly in me. It should be saturating me so that naturally what flows out of me is sounding more and more like my Savior than anything else. And I'm to be thankful. So what's our takeaway this evening? Our takeaway simply is when Jesus has first place in our lives, his peace, his word, and heartfelt gratitude are the overarching traits that will be seen in our daily living. But the question for us tonight is, how true is this of you? Do you know his peace? Are you letting it rule, have the final say? Or do you insist on getting the last word yourself? Are you spending so much time in, in his word on your own and then here, you know what I love about Sunday night is we get to end the day it's the same way we started it, deep in his word. I need that. I need to be fed more than once a day. I need the collective worship, the, the, the corporate worship of the body of Christ going to the King of Kings. Are you saturating yourself in God's word? And for what can you be and should you be thankful?